Hey everyone, so I'm talking about necrotizing fasciitis for the students in the room. My name is Fernando. Uh, so let's jump into this. Uh, quick outline, I'm going to be talking about anatomy, uh, classification system for neck fasci, which will help you organize the way that you approach this and uh, make sure that you don't miss certain important details when it comes to necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, a little bit of the pathophys management and a couple extra nuggets at the end. So uh, first, uh, skin anatomy. Um, it's some of, my, some of you might feel that it's not all that important, but in uh, certain regards it is and it'll help you remember certain things. You have the dermis and epidermis here. Um, um, and that's uh, where you're going to see your cellulitis and erysipelas, which are sometimes hard to distinguish. And then you're going to have neck fash, which is going to affect your fascial layer um, and oftentimes the subcutaneous tissue or the muscle underneath it. It's going to be important because um, well, while it's hard to distinguish these, sometimes you can have gangrenous uh, cellulitis, cellulitis, which needs to be treated as effectively as um, as effectively as uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, infections down here will track in a different way. So. Moving on, classification systems, you have your type 1 uh, infections, which are polymicrobial. Th this includes things like Klebsiella, uh, Klebsiella uh, proteus, uh, in the case of oral infections, bacteroides, and Clostridium. Uh, this kind of infection generally happens in sicker patient populations, older patients, so people with diabetes, uh, any form of immunosuppression, and vascular insufficiency. Um, then there's type 2, which I'm going to come back to later because there are some important things to know about type 2, and that is primarily a disease of group A strep, uh, plus or minus some staph. And then uh, 3, which is going to you're not going to see very often, but it's going to be important for the boards, is uh, marine gram negatives. Um, so again, your risk factors, uh, you know, dirty wounds, diabetes is uh, in the literature going to be your biggest risk factor, um, renal insufficiency, hepatic insufficiency, and trauma. You should do a good exam to see if there's any sort of sentinel uh, break in the skin, but you're not always going to see this. There are plenty uh, of case reports indicating that you can have bacterial translocation, so people who have uh, hepatobiliary surgeries can uh, have the translocation and develop neck fash after a, a procedure. Um, so here are two pictures, and on your screen, uh, on your screen left here, uh, you see a lesion that is uh, erythematous. Um, there's kind of maybe something, a herald thing there. And if you touch this, it'll probably be, erith, uh, be warm and potentially tender. Um, the thing is, uh, m the lesion will not be beyond this. It's uh, well demarcated. Over here, uh, some of you might feel that this is a relatively benign lesion, but I will tell you that the one on the left is actually just plain old cellulitis, and the one on the right is the case of neck fash. And what you see here, um, some important, uh, important uh, things to point out is that uh, you have this well demarcated area here, but then you also have some skin findings uh, distal and proximal to that main lesion. So you're going to have, whether it's uh, purpura or, or swelling, um, outside of that main lesion there. Uh, other salient features are going to be pain out of proportion, which uh, sometimes it's hard to conceptualize. So this, to me, doesn't look that bad. But this person might be in uh, writhing pain. It might get morphine and still be rolling around asking for more pain meds. Uh, the other thing that's described in the textbooks is uh, skin sclerosis. This skin will feel woody, and it'll often extend beyond these margins. Um, so this is a case, uh, it's a more advanced case, and it'll be a good time to talk about the pathophysiology. Um, this one you shouldn't miss. A lot of them are missed. Usually it's, uh, yeah, it's usually the early ones that are missed, but here you have the hemorrhagic bulli. And uh, the pathophys is basically, uh, there's direct invasion, rapid, rapid proliferation of the bacteria, which actually causes thrombosis of the vessels. That is part of your five Ps, your car essentially causing uh, arterial venous insufficiency. It causes extreme pain and also damages the nerve. Uh, so later in the disease process, this might actually be anesthetized. So going back to the anatomy, this is spreading along the fascial plane. So if you look at this picture, um, you'll see that this area is well demarcated. But if you touch this 
uh, distal to that margin, you will also feel skin thickening. It'll feel firm. You might feel crepitous. Though so don't be uh, reassured if you don't feel crepitous, because that does not mean that you do not have neck fash. And if you actually stood in the trauma bay or wherever you were watching this patient, within a few minutes, you might actually see a change to the wound. Uh, that purpura might extend proximally, or you might see some ruddy changes uh, happening elsewhere. Um, so I know Tom mentioned this last week. Uh, as you see all these things here, I mean, not that important. None of them are specific to this disease entity, but from the few cases that I have seen, they all had, uh, for some reason, were hyponatremic. They all had high white counts. Um, and the, one, the types that I saw, I think, were type 1. So they were diabetic. They had uh, really uh, uncontrolled sugars as well. Uh, but other things that you'll consider to diagnose this, uh, like Tom said last week, it's, it's going to require getting a surgeon down like immediately. And if they don't believe that it is uh, neck fascia, they'll have to do a cut down and look at the actual skin tissue. Uh, it'll look necrotic, dusky. Uh, if they put the finger, they may or may not be able to go through the fascia. Um, and um, x-ray is not particularly sensitive, but if you are looking for extra information, you might see some air CT scan a little bit more sensitive. And I'll let Mike talk about this some other time, but uh, there are some uh, uh, oceanographers who think that uh, you can look at th these conditions and see fascial thickening and fluid spreading along the fascial planes. Um, so again, you need your surgeon down, you know, on board. You need them um, to cut down, to take them to the OR, and perform debridements. Um, so I mentioned type 2, and this is actually an uh, interesting form of it because most of the times, uh, about actually 50% of the time, they will have concomitant uh, toxic shock syndrome. So you have like the double whammy, two life-threatening conditions. These people are going to have, so staph and strep are going to release exotoxins and superantigens, which are going to contribute to the overall sepsis picture. <coughs> and these people will actually benefit directly from clindamycin antibiotics, other people need source control, uh, Clinda will deactivate the toxins. Um, and IVAG has been shown to maybe help in refractory cases as well. 